Welcome to the White River Light Station Museum. I am the resident curator of the museum, Karen McDonald, and uh, we're about to take you on a tour of the museum and we'll cover the history and the basic facts and uh, some of the more exciting stories that, uh, that lie within this building, and there are many. And this room is what used to be the bedroom for the light keeper and his wife, our original light keeper. Uh, came from England, jolly old England. His name was Captain William Robinson. In his 30s, he and his wife Sarah Cooper Robinson came over, took, got passage to this area, and uh, did not come to, uh, to answer an ad for a uh, lightkeeper. He actually came because he wanted to get into the ship's chandler's business, which is outfitting ships with uh, 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 the metal anchor chains and such. And uh, when he got here, he noticed that um, the ship's captains were all uh, about the, the old river entrance into the area. And our namesake, which is the White River Light Station, plays an important role in the history here because without it, um, they would not be able to do the, the lumbering. And that's what this area was known for, was uh, the lumbering uh, operation. We were once known as the lumber queen or capital of the world, so it had worldwide status. The White River uh, feeds naturally into White Lake at the, uh, the far end, far end away from Lake Michigan, and then uh, has had a, a natural outlet However, the schooners could not sail into, far into the river to pick up lumber. So uh, what Captain Robinson did was to chat with the schooner captains and uh, they decided that it was an important uh, uh, object to, uh, to get a letter to the federal government. And uh, in doing so, uh, Captain Robinson assisted them in this endeavor and um, so the government came out, and this was the U.S. Lighthouse Service. And the U.S. Lighthouse Service, uh, federal arm of the government then, uh, ran the show for all the aids to navigation. And so they came out to the area and, and uh, realized that uh, we did indeed need a, a channel cut, link cut between Lake Michigan and White Lake. And uh, so they began that operation. And it took over two years to complete. Well, they asked Captain Robinson if he might be willing to, uh, to be first keeper in that regard. So uh, he agreed to do that. And he would horse and buggy uh, out here quite a distance. It just so happens that there was a huge fire in Chicago a year after this channel link was cut. And uh, they needed uh, lots of um, timber to rebuild Chicago. So they set up a contract with White Lake area to rebuild Chicago. So they decided with, with the uh, added traffic from the fire that uh, they needed a, a more powerful light and so they went about building this lighthouse and that was done and completed in 1875 and Captain Robinson actually helped to do the masonry work on the building. So I, I call him a bill of all trades because he did a little of everything. And this was actually Sarah and Captain Williams' uh, bedroom at one point, very small in many folks' uh, uh, opinions. And this uh, wall behind me is an example, uh, while we're here, of um, some of the aids to navigation along the west coast of Lower Peninsula, Michigan. And uh, I'm proud to say as a Michigander that um, born and raised in this state that we have more lighthouses than any other state in the U.S. We have 116 aids to navigation in the state of Michigan. And here's just, uh, just a few um, to start with. 
we go from St. Joseph, Michigan, all the way up to Mackinac. What are the more unusual lights that stand out on this wall? And they'll look about and they'll say, well, this one, and this one, of course, is unusual because, and they love that because it reminds them of a candy cane. But the reason that why they did that is this is called a day mark. And uh, as aids to navigation, every lighthouse uh, creates its own light signal. But of course, you have to have either a dark, stormy day or the dark of night to, to see that signal. So during a nice, bright, sunny day, you obviously are not going to put your light on because you're going to lose um, that through the atmosphere of the, the, in the daytime. So what you need is if it's a warning or a dangerous spot that you want to uh, have the ship's captains and crew navigate away from, you need to put some sort of distinguishing mark on them. So this is called a day mark. So number seven and nine are uh, also warning lights. And one of the things, the, the equations that they put into the mix when they were de determining what height uh, you needed to, uh, to build a, certain, a particular tower of a particular area was um, that you had to factor in one, the size um, of the lens, two, the height of the tower, and three, the natural curvature of the earth. So these are relatively high towers, over 100 feet high, compared to uh, ours, which is only 38 feet. And the reason being that we are considered a harbor light, and therefore as a harbor light, didn't need to get the light out quite as long a distance as you would with the, the danger or hazard lights. Every single lighthouse produced its own unique signal in light. Many a keeper would walk out pushing a cart on this bridge that was um, supplied with all that you needed with the wicks and the oil that you filled up previously in the oil house. Um, and you would have all that set to go so that you could light, and in this case, this is a double lighted system, it's called a range light, and so you would light the inner light and the outer light. Uh, we ran from 1875 until 1960 and uh, went through many changes. Uh, there was of course, first the lumbering, and then um, they went through the uh, steamship days. And there's a lovely painting that's on the wall back behind us of uh, the SS Carolina. It was a passenger steamer that operated during the early 1900s until about 1936. Um, and basically, the reason why the light station had to uh, was decommissioned and it had to close in 1960 is that there were some other businesses that used. Uh, the light, but never freighters. Uh, but basically, it, the commercial shipping died out. Many of these lights have a second career now. And ours was one of the first. We opened our doors in 1970 as the first uh, in the Lower Peninsula here uh, museum. This is uh, an example of what the uh, Fresnel lenses uh, look like. This is a sampling of the various orders, and um, Augustin Fresnel was the inventor of the lens, so it's uh, his surname. Early uh, use of whale oil, then they went to lard oil and various seed oils, and then they went to pressurized kerosene. We started here at the White River Light Station with uh, pressurized kerosene. Much like a grandfather clock or cuckoo clock, the, um, the light would turn on ball bearings and mercury. So right in the base here at the, uh, the bottom of the lens would be literally a, a, like a pool, a little bath of mercury and ball bearings, so it'd be frictionless turning. So you could basically take one finger and just give it a shove and it would uh, pretty much self-propel for a while. But you couldn't uh, keep it accurate that way, so the weight and pulley system would have a counterweight and a, a drop weight and the drop weight, would, uh, would, that would all be uh, connected to gears, much like a cuckoo clock or grandfather clock, and the gears would help turn um, in this weight-driven system. So as one weight was descending, the other one was going up So with the counterweight. So as the weight was descending, the lens would rotate around, and it would create a particular un unique characteristic of light signal and that was called a code signal or, or a character signal. And that would be different from every lighthouse. It would have its own unique pattern. Their job is to bend light 
and basically direct it to the center magnifier. So they all have magnifiers. This is called a bullseye lens. So when, that, when these would turn around, you would get all this refracted or bent light which would come out of your middle magnifier and that would produce more like a beam searchlight uh, effect. And so as those beams turned around, uh, as soon as you would get in with the eye contact of that light, uh, as it would come towards you, you would count seconds in between the next uh, band of light coming or beam of light coming um, towards you. So that was how it produced the signal unique to itself. That light had to be lit at night no matter what. And so a light keeper's job was, was a, a very, very important uh, job and, and presidents and dignitaries would come to your light station and you would often um, don your, your light keeper's uniform, which I'm wearing. And um, this was a man's uniform, never a woman keeper's uniform. And there were many, many women that were employed by the U.S. Lighthouse Service and um, they were considered civilian keepers, non-uniformed. This was uh, a, a replica that was made of an original light keeper's uniform. It has all the brass buttons with the uh, lights on them. And the K on the, the top uh, is, uh, stands for keeper. This hallway is um, what I refer to as our history hallway. And it uh, depicts uh, several of our keepers. Uh, we have some interesting memorabilia. Uh, in this hallway and uh, we have an old painting of the uh, White River which is a little bit of artistic license there but it's kind of a mystery painting. And there's some of our characters here and this is Captain Robinson sitting on the steps of front steps of the lighthouse. This is him in his elderly years and uh, he was kind of a portly fellow, portly chap from jolly old England as I mentioned from Tynemouth, England and um, he and Sarah, and Sarah's to the right here. She was a backup as, as well as Thomas, and we can go to his picture in a, in a bit. And uh, Sarah, unfortunately, died at, uh, in her later, latter 50s of a stroke. And uh, there's quite a love, love story between the two of them. She actually bore 13. She had 13 live birds, but they lost two uh, as young, uh, young infants. So they had 11 varying ages. So they came with six from England in, in their 30s as a, a, a young couple. So this is uh, Captain Robinson and Sarah. And there's some pictures of him in his elder years. Um, he lived to be 87 and uh, in his 87th year of life he was then living with his eldest grandson Captain William Bush. And uh, at that point the idea was that Captain Robinson grooms Captain Bush uh, in, as kind of an intern uh, for some time into becoming the head keeper. So it's kind of, um, you, we're going to switch this. You, Captain Bush is going to become the keeper and Captain Robinson's going to kind of back away. But apparently but Captain Robinson really did not want to have much part in that scenario. So he, <laughs> um, I interviewed Captain Bush's uh, daughter and named Loretta and she said that she remembers Cap Robinson and that he was pretty cantankerous in his elderly years and um, that he would say, uh, quote, he, as long as I have two good working legs, I'm going up there, meaning I'm going to go out to tend the light. So my guess is that that gave him uh, a reason to get up in the morning into his 87th year. They didn't want to actually pay for an extra mouth to feed. You know, they, they gave you a uniform and they even had, you even had dishes that said U.S. Lighthouse Service on them, U.S. LHS. They gave him a departure date and he died with a very close short order of that. So we had a series of uh, keepers after Captain William Bush who served many years and he and his wife had a, a larger family, not quite as large as the Robinsons. And um, and then it went, and we're going to go over to this wall over here. So this is uh, kind of a lineage of, um, of various keepers. We start out with Captain Robinson, and then we go to his son Thomas, and then we've got Captain William Bush. We have a lot of Williams in the mix. Uh, William Robinson's father was Williamson Robinson. It's quite a mouthful. Uh, and then we go into Coast Guard, and we have a chart here of, of various Coast Guard um, officers because the Coast Guard took over 
in uh, the latter 1930s. By 1940, it was so. Uh, it was in position, and um, so we had Coast Guard families that would live in this light station. And there was a uh, Coast Guardsman uh, that came with his wife, uh, Francis. His name was Leo Worry, and he came with his wife, Francis. Um, and Francis, like most women that were married to keepers, learned to be backup and a keeper. By some uh, circumstances, they parted ways, and uh, she came back some years later as a civilian keeper, and uh, she's still with us, she's still amongst us, and she's in her 80s now, has a pretty remarkable story. And she remembers having um, the lard backup, uh, the kerosene, and as a, as a backup um, to the then, in those days, the uh, electricity was installed in about 1919 in this building, so um, by the time she came into a position, uh, it was just a matter of turning on the switch, so everything was uh, electric, electrified. Francis uh, got on the program in the 1950s, got on the program, What's My Line, and stumped the panel because um, no one, um, and she remembers talking to Steve Allen and Kitty Carlisle and the, and the gang there, and uh, she uh, was happy and elated with the fact, still has to tell that story about how um, nobody could guess that uh, a woman would be a light keeper. <laughs> and I just love that story because it's, uh, it's darling the way she tells it and I wish she could be standing here doing so. Uh, before we finish with this hallway, we'll definitely want to mention that, uh, that we had a Coast Guard uh, station that was built in 1885, which we have some photos of here. And we have way up at the top, it was quite, a, quite an endeavor to get this in here, we have a U.S. Life Saving Service steering oar. Here we are in the Edward Middleton Memorial Room, second floor of the lighthouse, and uh, this actually started out as uh, a bedroom for the lads that grew up uh, under the care of uh, Mr. and Mrs. Robinson. And at one time, I was told by descendants that there were seven boys occupying this room, which is pretty amazing. Here we have our original lens. We had a custom case made some years ago for it. As a keeper, you would uh, always dust and polish and keep this lens um, as jewel-like as possible because they were considered jewels, all handmade from Paris, France. This is called a fourth order Fresnel lens. And this is one of the seven different sizes of Fresnel lenses. And as you can see, um, it has the magnifier in the center, prisms top and bottom. So the bottom prism would collect all available light and bend it up to the second um, prism up and it would basically kind of wick its way up to the center. And you can see the, the uh, large wide section magnifier in the center. And then the prisms at the top would do just the opposite. Even though they're angled upwards towards the ceiling, um, they do just the opposite. They take the light that would otherwise be directed up in that, uh, that direction and they uh, refract it back. So it kind of angles back down from prism to prism to prism down towards the center. So you kind of get this sort of effect. So you get all this concentrated light, which then in turn goes through this magnifier in the center. So you've got this real concentrated uh, light that's magnified out it has the two brass doors and the, uh, the glass sides, um, prism sides, were of course where the light was emitted through. And I mentioned earlier downstairs when I showed the painting that we also had a, um, a ruby red glass panel that was affixed with brackets that would be attached to the bottom ring and the top. So that bracket would come out and it would have this rectangular red panel that would sit affixed on the exterior of the uh, prisms and the magnifier. So imagine this turning around then on that weight and pulley system. And so now you're getting what, would, what essentially would be white light coming through, emitted through. And then as this would turn, you've got two brass doors. So the brass doors, as they turned, it came towards you, it would be an off pattern. But what's great about the brass doors is that they have two purposes uh, designed uh, to do two special um, assistance here in this whole operation. One, to create an off pattern. Two, to 
intensify or um, uh, brighten, mirror the light source because inside of the brass doors is sterling silver plating. So um, as, as, as those would turn, uh, that would create that off pattern but brighten and intensify the light inside. They would have specially sized designed brass lamps that were um, you would be placed inside that would have big chimneys, big tall chimneys. So this would turn around and create that flash pattern and then the ship's captains would, would see that and in turn um, know where they were that they were getting close to the White Lake Harbor. There is a motor and that was installed of course after electricity so that would have been after 1919 and um, but in place of that, or before that, preceding that was a what I mentioned earlier about the uh, weight and pulley system. There was actually a spool, which uh, would be would have a cable wrapped around, much like a garden hose. Hand cranking that would then lift that weight up uh, to the top, and then it would start its descension down. So uh, every three hours, you would do that. In this case, and then right in front of that motor here is a bulb, which is an original bulb. It's a GE 1000 watt, 120 volt bulb, much like a big projector bulb. And so what they use now is um, they have actually a relay with several bulbs and it's on a wheel. And um, so the job of Coast Guard uh, personnel that are checking these lighthouses would just make sure that the backup bulbs are intact. So you have a, a series of those so that when it senses the primary bulb um, burnt out and it would automatically switch to the next one and ignite the next bulb. But anyway, this is what I consider to be the most important artifact that's in our collection is our original lens um, because without it um, we wouldn't be a light station. Uh, so when it sat uh, empty for a few years after it was decommissioned, the um, light was shot at unfortunately by vandals. Uh, it was decommissioned in the lighthouse was decommissioned in 1960 and uh, the building sat empty. Descendants that are here in the area uh, decided to raise uh, the money amongst themselves, $6,250, to purchase the light station from the Coast Guard in uh, about 1965 and gifted it to our local township. Uh, did not have the money at that time to purchase it um, with the notion of turning it into a museum. Uh, this is one of our newest exhibits in the museum and um, we're quite excited to, to have this beast. Uh, a lot of people say, wow, that's a, that's a large pair of shorts here. It was designed so that various sized people could fit into it and this is actually a life-saving device. It's called a breeches buoy and this is the, the breeches part of it. Um, and it was uh, designed to uh, climb into. It had a reinforced padded crotch here. This is called a Lyle gun, first developed in 1878 by uh, David Lyle. And uh, basically what you would do is you would pack a charge and um, it would catapult out uh, a device that uh, was a metal projectile, which would be uh, pushed into the, the uh, metal and would be pushed into the, the base of the cannon would go way in there and then there's an eye hook and the eye hook would be attached to a rope. And then you would use a device that is called a flaking box. Um, the flaking box was uh, methodically wound on a pegboard. The, the rope that was fired out to be fired out was methodically wound on a pegboard of sorts and you can see uh, the, the pattern here. It was uh, somebody's job to learn that <laughs> winding uh, pattern. And uh, once wound on there, it would be uh, essentially flipped over and dumped into a box that was uh, the, the top lid essentially. That box in turn would have that rope with that memory of being on the pegs, sit at an angle close by attached to the eye uh, hook of the metal projectile. So when the cannon was fired, this line would be shot out from either shore to ship or ship to ship within several hundred feet. <clears throat> and when it would arrive on the ship, sometimes it would put a hole in the ship if it wasn't aimed right, but if it works right, it's designed to be 
uh, for the rope to be detached and positioned on a higher angle on the ship as the mast and, and such, but the higher level of the ship. And then they would send out what's called a hawser line on that first initial shot line. And that hawser line would be essentially the line that could hold the weight of humans uh, carried aboard the um, breeches buoy. So once you got that hawser line fed out, with uh, it actually had directions uh, in French and in English, insert your the, the life-saving uh, folks could uh, could then hope that the folks on the ship they could come in and certainly help assist, but you could only fit so many in the breeches buoy one. But this is a photo of a man riding the breeches buoy in, and so basically you could you could ride safely across the worst of seas and uh, high, the worst of storms um, above high seas safely from ship to shore. Because when you think about it, when you have these big surf lifeboats that are wood, and you're going to take those out with a crew to paddle out to, to a ship in distress, you're going to actually lose lives trying to save lives because in some of the more violent storms and when you've got you know, eight to ten foot waves, you're going to smash a boat while en route to do the life, participate with the life saving. So this was um, quite a unique uh, life saving device uh, that was created to uh, offer safe passage across the water. This is probably one of the more unusual pieces that um, we get questions about on a regular basis. It's um, it's a from a blueprint of a trading ship that was used in India, the city of Karachi, SS City of Karachi, which of course means steamship. It was basically a blueprint of the cargo hold, so a cross section of the ship where you were with ship balancing. And that was imperative because if um, you left port without balancing your ship and um, filled up all your cargo holds of any particular ship that was a cargo vessel, even even a passenger vessel, you want to make sure that it's balanced properly on favorable waves and you've got more weight to one side, it could flip the ship over. And this was a blueprint and this um, this lifts up. So this is kind of a, a level um, device. And you would flip these up and there's a little, just like a um, the level that you use in woodworking and measuring anything to see if it's level, there's um, a little bubble that uh, appears in the, we have a little mini leveler here. And then they have on the side here a series of what are called slacker weights and you would flip these over so there would be so many slacker weights that you would fit into the equation as well. So it was really like a mathematical problem. So the various devices that were created along the way and this is one of the more unique pieces. This is called a Ralston indicator. This is called a hardened starfire. It's a long title. Starfire extinguishing grenade. And so when you think about a grenade, you think of something that's really destructive. But like the like the breeches buoy or the, or the Lyle gun, um, it is a uh, to extinguish fires in a light station that uh, has no means, uh, earthly means of having a fire department close by with which to help from, uh, you know, to put out fires. So mostly wooden lighthouses or and or remote uh, lighthouses uh, that were far away from any source to, um, to extinguish a fire. These were essentially made to be destroyed, so they're quite, collector, uh, quite the collector's item now. It was quite common to have at least a dozen or more of these on a rack. So they had a little groove, uh, indentation groove at the bottom, and it was quite common to have at least a dozen or more of these on a rack just at the ready in the event of a fire. And the original ones had tetrachloride, which is really toxic, um, is the filler inside. Uh, and you would throw that at the base of a fire. So you would aim and throw it right at the base to extinguish the fire. Later they used a saltwater brine solution of which uh, is, is contained in this bottle. It's one of my, one of my favorite uh, smaller artifacts in the museum. Uh, we managed to be able to replicate an original uh, traveling library. And these were uh, quite commonly used in, um, again, remote lighthouses. Uh, in 1876, uh, they had numbered uh, series. 
So this one says U.S. LHS for U.S. Lighthouse uh, Establishment, EST, library number 140. Our teachers are very happy that we have this in our collection. One of our other collections that uh, I've been working diligently on and uh, the Friends Group to uh, add to our collection of uh, U.S. Lighthouse Service and early Coast Guard items and they are becoming uh, rare at this point and uh, the price is certainly going up so the obscurity factor is, is increasing and so my criteria has been to add to our collection while they're still affordable. The originals are very expensive. We also have a, a brass U.S. Lighthouse Service clock which uh, I was lucky to find uh, in the late uh, 1980s and I snatched that up and it still got the winding key, still works. A couple of commemorative uh, custard cups that uh, were uh, created in this area uh, in the early uh, 1900s and the it's a hand-painted scene that depicts our life-saving station in the channel in front. Several years later uh, one of our friends group members found a, a vase that is part of the collection so we snatched that up as well and so now we have uh, several items that uh, depict the, the life-saving station and we were quite happy to see that because uh, I had no idea that uh, anything like that was actually created and uh, much less available to, to purchase years later so very interesting to think that uh, they started out in White Lake and uh, made their way to the east coast of the United States and, and then vicariously made their way back. And I always like to think about how many hands were exchanged, how many, how many owners uh, held these custard cups before they were purchased by us. This blanket uh, has an interesting story attached to it. Years ago, uh, we we're fortunate enough to have uh, some classrooms from Muskegon area elementary schools, uh, Central Elementary, come to visit and did several tours for them, educational tours, and the teachers decided, a couple of teachers uh, decided to uh, to stimulate the children to do something benevolent for the uh, lighthouses, a thank you exchange, so they did a fundraiser promotional idea was to create a lighthouse patchwork quilt which was also a family event, several family events, so several of the children helped out and there's a picture of the quilt in the far right corner there and uh, parents and children alike uh, helped out with this and uh, some of them are more elaborate than others, it's quite, quite a nice collection of uh, lighthouses on the quilt and it was all patchworked and they raffled that quilt off and raised over $800 uh, to, uh, to give to back to the lighthouse here uh, as a thank you and in lieu of a purchase of a new artifact. And I thought, well, since we're on this theme of a quilt, wouldn't it be nice to have a blanket uh, if I could find one? At that point, I just, it was just a, a thought that crossed my mind. Wouldn't it be nice to find either a quilt or a blanket that was from the U.S. Lighthouse Service um, to keep on that theme. So right around that time, this uh, dealer in the East Coast that I had been working with uh, had an original U.S. Lighthouse Service wool blanket. In the center, it's got the original U United States Lighthouse Service emblem, which uh, is pretty much standard in, in those days um, of the U.S. Lighthouse Service. So uh, quite quite a unique piece. It's got all the original design, very no holes. Uh, it's in perfect condition. And it just happened to come in around the same price uh, of the uh, fundraiser. And I stirred the pot and pulled out the winning ticket. It, it just so happens that it was one of the teachers that uh, decided upon this project. And uh, what I loved about that part of the story is that she decided that she wanted to donate the quilt back to the school. So it's on permanent exhibit. That way future generations will be able to see both the original quilt that inspired the fundraiser and the blanket, that uh, artifact blanket that was purchased with the money that was generated from the fundraiser. This is an artifact that I picked up in the late uh, 
1980s, and it is a Frederick Remington Liberty ship bell, and uh, was used during World War II. And it was a, served two purposes. It was a way to get attention of the shipmates because of the sound of the bell, and it was also uh, a way to alert ships out on the water that you were, were out there, out and about on the water, so it was a, a, used as, also as a fog signal. Quite popular in the museum because it's so loud that uh, I had to create a sign that says, please ring a bell softly, only one ring per family, because the little ones would stand here and just ring it incessantly, and it's so loud that uh, I could hear it all the way down in the, the entryway of the uh, museum where um, we, we uh, work with admissions and gift shop sales. So I'm going to give you a little example of how loud this thing is. And, and you can hear it has quite a nice echo to it. Uh, and that's just really relatively soft ringing compared to what some kid children will do. <laughs> They'll just literally grab the rope and, and haul that clapper across that metal and it's, uh, it's quite loud. It's almost deafening. So we do have some hands-on uh, items in the museum collection that we encourage people to use so they can get a sense of the sounds and the motions and such. And we're going to walk towards another item that's one of my favorites. This is a, a ship's helm, or otherwise known as a ship's wheel. And what I loved about this is that the wheel base uh, was made in Grand Haven, Michigan, which is our coastal neighbor. And uh, it's, it's, it's made by a company called Dake, Dake Engine Company. And so, of course, initially when I saw it in the collection, I was filled at just the craftsmanship in the wheel and the inlay work here. And uh, when I looked at the pedestal piece and realized that it was created uh, in our coastal uh, area, uh, I was even more excited. And uh, so you hear this on a regular basis downstairs. It has a bit of a shudder to it. <laughs> um, but children, and actually I'm sure there are many adults that will attest to, to using this on a regular basis too. But it uh, has a nice little spin to it. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of children, I'll say, when they, when they come in as families, I'll say, well, you know, there are some items that you can touch upstairs because the parents will say, no touching in anything in the museum. And I'll say, you know, actually, there are some things that you can touch. One of them, it makes a sound, and it's a big ship's bell. And you'll want to be careful not to ring it too loud because it'll really hurt your ears. And the second is a ship's helm. And you can stand there and uh, pretend that you're a ship's captain and you can decide where you want to take your family on a trip. So you can have them stand a little ways from you, you can stand right in front of that ship's helm and take her for a spin and decide where you're going to, where you're going to take your family on vacation. So uh, the children really love to use this and it is a beautiful, beautiful uh, handcrafted item. So um, I'm very proud to have this in our collection. Amongst our collection is also a series of photographs. We have quite a, um, a nice photographic, uh, historic photograph collection. And uh, this wall is pretty much depicting the vessels that served White Lake, and there were many. Uh, one of the more prominent ones that started out in the early 1900s was the Steamship Carolina. And that uh, brought passengers from Chicago to White Lake uh, during the summer months uh, from 1902 to 1936 and uh, it was only three dollars round trip to start. Um, that was your berth included overnight passage. It would take about seven hours for it to come in and I had a lovely story from uh, a descendant of Captain Robinson tell me that uh, when she was growing up in the lighthouse, this would be Captain Bush's daughter, who was our second keeper's uh, child. She was in her 80s when she told the story. She said that uh, life was pretty boring with all of your siblings. You really didn't have um, many children to play with that were close by the lighthouse because you went across the channel. You were rowboated across the channel. When you got to the other side, you had to walk one and a half miles to a one-room schoolhouse called the Mouth School. And uh, that didn't really lend itself to having a lot of friends to play with because there weren't many houses close by the lighthouse. So when this ship uh, came in uh, the harbor and uh, the steamship uh, trade was uh, developed, 
she was elated to see all the children that were aboard the ship coming from Chicago. And the children that grew up in this lighthouse were just, uh, the parents had to literally hold them back from excitement of, you know, almost jumping into the channel and swimming after the ship because they were starving for new children to play with. And she said, the good news is that you had them close by, they were staying in the resorts and hotels, and um, she had this great exchange, and, and uh, I remember her, her words, uh, she said, and they were telling us stories about the first picture, moving picture show, um, and uh, buying the first TV sets and uh, such, and uh, so she said that we, you know, they had items that we didn't have, and yet we were just as exciting to them because we had a different lifestyle that was unique to them, even though we thought it was much more boring than the things that were available to them in Chicago. So they had this lovely exchange, all kinds of excitement, and then about the time when you got really bored of these new kids, a new crop would come. So they would they would leave, and this they would stay maybe a couple of weeks, and you know, on their vacation, stay at the the local lodges. And we have a couple of them that are still standing the Lakeside Inn and the Michelin Linda Beach Lodge. So uh, that that vessel was uh, quite prominent, as were there were some little steam-operated excursion vessels and little ferries that would take people about on little sightseeing tours on White Lake um, that had benches and like a surreed fringe canopy over them. So uh, that was also a way to to move about. And these are some photos of the docks um, that you would be uh, picked up with your horse-drawn carriage uh, once the steamship arrived. Um, there was a place called the Arcade, which you would uh, you would get, uh, you know, there would be a mail uh, place to get to pick up your mail and uh, all kinds of little things to pick up along the way, and then you would be clip-clopped to your, with horse-drawn carriage to your prospective lodging. Uh, also unique to this area uh, was a four-car passenger ferry, which in these times with the high gas prices, people are saying, wouldn't it be nice if they could revive that? Uh, I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon, but it's called the Trails Meet Ferry. And it crossed between uh, the Whitehall side and the Montague sides of White Lake, uh, right towards the end of the channel as it comes into White Lake from Lake Michigan. And uh, it ran from 1929 to 1942 Basically, World War II ended the service, but um, it was an underwater cable uh, ferry and saved about 16 miles because it's a seven mile long lake, White Lake is. So to go from our side of the channel to the Montague side uh, to the two different parks is a, a good 14 or more miles. So, uh, so it would save a lot, of, a lot of gas going around the lake to get there. Well, as the legend lives on from the Chippewa on down, that famous Gordon Lightfoot tune, um, which several people I'm sure you're watching this grew up with, um, in November, uh, on November 11th, 1975, the Edmund Fitz uh, met her match with uh, Lake Superior. All kinds of theories as to why she is uh, residing at the bottom, but uh, Nonetheless, we managed to acquire the life ring. Um, this is back before my time here, and uh, apparently it was uh, uh, given to a uh, fellow's brother who used to be a curator here years ago in the early 1970s. And so neither the life ring or the person that uh, acquired it uh, went down with the ship, so that's uh, a, the good part of the story. Um, but the Edmund Fitz was one of the longest ore carrier vessels, over 700 feet long, and uh, she met her fate and was literally broken in half and lays in two sections on the bottom of Lake Superior, and there's a lovely uh, lighthouse up in uh, Whitefish Point, Michigan that uh, has quite an elaborate exhibit about the Fitz, and they managed to go down in a sub years ago, retrieve the bell off, the original bell off the ship, the brass bell, and uh, all 29 men who uh, were aboard the ship, that's including the captain, perished, and uh, no bodies were found uh, after she, uh, she went down, so um, they decided that the wreckage is going to be the memorial site uh, to the lives that were lost, to the many men um, that perished with her. And uh, so the bell was taken 
off the Edmund Fitz brought up with the sub and um, because it's laying in over 900 feet of water which uh, at that level gets uh, uh, next to impossible to dive in and um, without uh, some sort of uh, sub device and, uh, and it's also relatively cold down there so they retrieved the bell, brought it up, put it on exhibit in the Whitefish Point Museum and uh, then put a replica bell, had a, a quite a nice ceremony with the relatives uh, um, connected to the 29 men that perished and uh, engraved all the names on the bell, rang it 29 times for all the members that perished and um, and then put it back down on the Edmund Fitzgerald. So we have a uh, original article. Uh, it was on the front page of the Muskegon Chronicle back when she went down Muskegon. Uh, this was Tuesday, November 11th, 1975. So uh, many people have read this article and uh, talked to their family members who are much younger that they have no idea about that famous story. But uh, I have heard the story about uh, the Anderson that was following behind the Edmund Fitz that uh, fateful night and uh, you know massive storm and the light at Whitefish Point was uh, not visible so the Edmund Fitz was uh, lost and blind as a bat out there. So the um, ship's captain Bernie uh, Cooper uh, and the, the captain of the Anderson were communicating and uh, last um, communication uh, from the Fitz was that she was taking on water and then she just fell silent on the, the radar so um, hard to hard to say what would uh, happen there but many many theories but um, we were excited to have such a relic because obviously it's very rare but if you have an opportunity get up to Whitefish Point and check out their collections it's quite uh, quite a, an elaborate one and uh, quite a nice lighthouse uh, to boot. This is uh, the Lloyd Colby Memorial Room. So um, that's, that's a bit of a, a story to, to go into, but uh, I, I highly recommend that folks come in and read the story about his life. And um, but this is his memorial room. And uh, we have uh, quite a few steamship related artifacts that uh, I've collected over the years and uh, two of them in particular that I'm much more drawn to uh, because of the un either unusual quality or rarity of it um, is the Nicholson ship log and this was found in Cleveland, Ohio still works but uh, we don't use it as such any longer um, wound up with a key in, it, in this clock device on the top um, it was built in the early 1900s and it recorded the time, the speed in knots per hour and uh, was used worldwide on steamships. So um, this was a very expensive item that I did a fundraiser for years ago and managed to, uh, to purchase and put in our collection. So we're, we're quite excited to, to have that. And this is one of the more favorite items that uh, one of our docents really likes to uh, elaborate on and this is called a ship's water closet. This is from the steamship Chippewa and was built in the early 1900s in Toledo, Ohio. And uh, basically this was pretty much standard on a passenger steamship. And you've got this beautiful copper plated sink. And, um, and the way that you would drain the sink once you, you had your, your uh, vase that was, or your pitcher that was um, full of water. And so you would fill that up and and brush your teeth and do everything that you needed with water and then um, that was the early years and then eventually they would have water um, that would be drawn up with this tap here she would pull this lever down and a little spot for your soap and your little toothbrush so that was just a really uh, nice artifact that I managed to find um, back about 10 years ago and added to our collection. And we have various compasses and, and uh, navigational devices throughout the museum. This is one of my favorite pieces. It's a binnacle, which um, is a compass inside of this chamber area here. And uh, a lot of people ask about these two big items on either side. And those were uh, essentially detractors. They're made of lead. And uh, what they would do is they would detract from any metallic pole off the ship that would otherwise 
take away from your true north reading because it was all magnetized and um, so you've got, you've got so many areas in the ship that could literally change that needle and uh, pull you off a true north and of course it's imperative that you know uh, your directions and uh, so that was one of the devices that was uh, quite commonly used on a, a steamship and, uh, and quite a nice piece of hardwood base there and uh, these are two vintage uh, one of them is a rowboat motor and the other one is, is uh, one of the first Evinrudes, um, early, early uh, 1900s Evinrudes and um, we have the advertisement to it and uh, they're quite quite a, a, exciting devices that uh, many people that are into fishing enjoy looking at. Um, the, this is a Lockwood Ash rowboat motor and of course the Evinrude and they still make these lovely sounds. Of course, we don't encourage the public to do it, but I can do it. You can hear the steam. You hear that when I turn the, the wheel. It sounds like a steamship on it. <laughs> this is the uh, Floyd Grover uh, part of our memorial room, and um, he was a prominent fisherman and uh, followed his father's footsteps. This is back when uh, fishing was quite prominent on uh, Lake Michigan, uh, commercial fishing with this family owned business. And you can see there are some pictures of some, some of the, see how large some of these fish uh, they, were that they caught. They had um, nets that they would wind, uh, their fish nets, uh, and it was located across the channel and uh, down a bit on the Montague side. And uh, so they would go right past our lighthouse on their way out. And you can see here's the, the tugboat called the Grover Brothers. And um, basically they ran for a number of years and they would uh, sell it fresh caught and on ice and, uh, and they would ship it off to various locations. And uh, I remember some of the big fish or s larger small fish stories would be that they would leave, uh, of course, uh, completely empty of fish and come back several hours later into uh, sometimes the dark of night would leave in the dark of morning and sometimes come back uh, after sunset and be loaded so full of perch and whatever type of fish they were trying to catch that day that uh, she would be riding low in the water when she came back. Um, so of course every fisherman has a big fish tail so you know I heard quite a few stories in that regard. Um, in close calls on the water and such, but uh, they are a very prominent family in the in the area, and uh, we were happy to do this memorial tribute to uh, Floyd and his father and family. Uh, he came up here and was in ill health, and managed to. Uh, we had a little ribbon cutting ceremony, actually for uh, the Colbys when we introduced the Colby exhibit room here, and then for the. Um, the Grover family. This light uh, station was uh, helpful in assisting them with their uh, fishing operation as well. Uh, this room was uh, of course the smaller of the two rooms in the, in the second floor and this was pretty much occupied by the uh, a couple of the daughters of Captain Robinson. Before we're done with this room we want to talk qu quickly about the uh, steamship uh, South America she was called the Queen of the Great Lakes, and there was the North American, South American lines. It was uh, the Georgian Bay line as well. And uh, I have many, many people that uh, visit the lighthouse on a regular basis that tell me um, enviable tales about uh, traveling on the South or North American lines. They would take passage on um, the uh, North or South American line and go to Mackinac Island. So that was a very popular senior class trip for a number of years. Here we are at the very tower top. This is uh, called the gallery of the uh, light station. And uh, this is all cast iron, very solid. And uh, we have uh, a gorgeous view and this is a particularly nice day. You can see we've got some, I've got some sun on me today. And uh, we are 38 feet high. And uh, you figure the lens was about in that spot there. So there wasn't a lot of room to move around up here for the keeper. Um, the gallery is considered outside, which is the railing part. They call that the gallery. Very thick glass windows. 
which of course uh, makes for a greenhouse effect. But we have some air vents here that are, are brass. Um, they had brass coverlets that uh, you would pivot and this would adjust your airflow. You can see the screen there and uh, airflow is very important. On a windy day you can feel the wind coming right through there and airflow to a, a light keeper was everything because um, you figure during the days of the, uh, the different various oils, but especially kerosene was, had a tendency to smoke up. And uh, if you didn't want to be asphyxiated while you were up tending the light, but you also wanted to make sure that the, uh, the wick was burning clean, you were trimming it and making sure that the airflow was adjusted through. We have one vent door to my left um, that really doesn't provide a lot of airflow in because of the, uh, the way it's facing but um, it does, does provide a little bit of circulation through here. And there's also a way at the top of the apex of the tower is, uh, which you can't see from here, is a ball that's called a ventilator ball. And so they would adjust the airflow up there as well. But we have a lovely view. You can see we've got a bolt coming in right now into our channel. And I always try to, as I stand here and gaze out at the, the ever-changing colors on that beautiful lake, Lake Michigan, I think about the historical times. I wish I could go back in time and see these magnificent sailing schooners coming in just as that boat is all sails up and uh, flowing into this channel uh, and then exiting out with loads and loads of lumber. We also have a freighter. If you look straight out, we've got a freighter. She's kind of in the a uh, little to the left of the channel there. Uh, we have a lot of powerboat action. We do get some sailboats and everything's privately owned that comes in here. Occasionally we'll have uh, the Port City Princess from Muskegon that is uh, an excursion boat that comes out uh, in the summer months. Uh, they offer uh, entertainment and uh, food and cocktails and you, you go out there in the evening and you have your uh, little history uh, cruise. And uh, we are in a lovely dune setting up here, which uh, I know there are a lot of people that can't make it to the top here, so it's quite, quite nice to see the aerial view of the dunes. So we have quite a bit of property in front of the lighthouse, and a common question that is posed to me is, uh, why is the lighthouse sitting so far back from the shore? Did the shore develop uh, further out in front of the lighthouse over the years? And that is not the case. Um, this is considered a channel light, and it was never built intentionally right on Lake Michigan, so the shore has not um, uh, expanded out in front of the lighthouse over the years. It was actually intentionally set back, and uh, with the pier light and the lighthouse, they didn't want the two of them side by side uh, working simultaneously um, in close proximity, so you, you would see the 14-mile uh, light range of the light station uh, light here from here, this vantage point, and then you of course would see the the uh, tower light or the light at the end of the pier. And of course now we have two automated lights that have a, a solar sensor and they kick the light on at night and activate the light and then shut it down during the daytime. So of course that you don't need uh, a paid keeper to go out and do that any longer and we're also missing our catwalk that was taken down years ago. But this was all wood originally much more narrow, um, kind of uh, very crude looking in the early years. And um, I would say over the last seven years, uh, 70 years ago, we had improvements done to the channel and they put in this lovely sidewalk and it's uh, quite a recreational spot now for people to take in sunsets. And, uh, and it's just, again, a lovely, lovely view here. So what we're wanting to do here is for those that uh, are not able to make it up to the top of the tower. Just to give you a panoramic view of what it'd be like to uh, uh, be sailing about uh, up the coast of Lake Michigan, what you would be seeing, of course, uh, from the aerial view from the tower top. And you do see we've got some trees obscuring the view, but of course those trees, when the lighthouse was active, were uh, not grown up to that size. They were quite dwarfed at that point, and uh, it was pretty much all sand dune around here. And we're moving basically from the south to the Montague side. We're still on the Whitehall side. And we cross over the pier to Montague. On a ship coming in, you would come right down there and 
meander your way into White Lake, which um, we're very, very happy to have this channel put in. And of course, we thank Captain Robinson as being one of the tools or instruments to uh, to get this this channel cut in the early years. He uh, was instrumental in writing a letter to the federal government so that the channel could be dug along with some of the other ship's captains. So we're very, very thankful to him for his input here and for all the hard work that uh, have, has been done over the years to maintain this channel. Army Corps of Engineers still maintains it and uh, comes in and paints it every so often and tends to uh, the rocks and makes sure that everything's ship shape out in the channel. And originally this room was used to store kerosene um, flammable supplies, which uh, makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? It's like having a bomb in your basement. Um, so that wasn't the best idea. And uh, so in the early 1900s, they decided, 1902, decided to build an oil house, a brick oil house. We've got a number of items down here that um, are off the steamships. These three lights are um, navigational lights at night that uh, basically uh, tell other ships I'm going in a particular direction and your red, red light is always the port or left side of the ship and these were kerosene fired and then this is the middle bow light which is the front center and then on the right here we've got the starboard side of the ship which is the right side of the ship and or the green light. Um, I'm holding on to uh, another one of our, our hands-on uh, artifacts that is a real hit with the younger folk um, because it's kind of a push-pull. This is called a bilge pump and uh, this would uh, take the water out through hoses, kind of almost like a hydraulic unit, only hand operated. I'm sure during the times when they <laughs> were taken on water in the bilge of the ship, the, the bottom of the ship, um, you would want to get that water out quite quickly. So you wouldn't be doing it at this pace. You would have a real hefty pace with a very steady pace with, with a couple of men, one on either side, of course. And then the hoses were attached uh, down below. We have um, our original electric stove, the old AB White stove that I actually used uh, for several years until we ran out of parts for it because they just don't make a lot of replacement parts for it anymore. Uh, so it's down here on exhibit, uh, but it was the, the first electric stove that they, they had in use at the uh, light station here. And this is also a room that I do my off-season projects in, and you can see one of mine um, in the works. Um, I asked our maintenance man if he would kindly take the shutters down off the building, and these were all custom replicated years ago, and of course they're made out of wood, and like any wood surface that's on the exterior of any building that's sitting right on Lake Michigan, you're going to get subject to the worst of the worst conditions. Uh, when I have to do any kind of painting that uh, isn't conducive to the temperatures as we come into the fall, and uh, just kind of, I call it our potpourri room, uh, a little of this, little of that, uh, ship relic pieces and things that were donated and, and such. So the, the, uh, the reason for the, uh, the cast iron solid doors like that was for fire uh, prevention because uh, pretty much everything from the tower top down, if, if you have flammable kerosene, it's going to fall straight down if you spill it at the top or any flammable illuminant that you would, a light keeper might be using. And uh, there are holes, uh, graded holes in the spiral staircase, metal spiral staircase. And that, of course, was so that uh, anything could fall through the holes, so they would be lighter um, and uh, very durable. And uh, so all those cast iron doors were specifically uh, used for fire prevention, so those would all be closed at night um, or and or during the day when the lens was in operation. Uh, the spiral staircase uh, is a unique device, very, very solid. Um, it was essentially, it co consists of a, uh, a pole that was lowered down and uh, you had a poured basement and each step is individually stacked, so it actually has a cylinder on the uh, base of the stair, 
a step and that was uh, threaded on the pole and stacked and then fanned out and strategically fanned out in position and then bolted underneath to secure the stairs in place. So quite a unique device and, and our staircase was made at a, in a company called Ryerson Ironworks which was out of Ohio and um, yeah, a lot of people ask whether the stairs are sturdy and if they're going to hold them and, and I can guarantee you these stairs aren't going anywhere and of course they're, they're so close to the, uh, the walls of the thick thick walls of the light station that uh, they're basically there's no room for it to move there's no give so um, so it's a very, very stable device that uh, was, was created for these light stations. Well, welcome to the gift shop. Uh, we're here in what used to be the uh, bedroom for Captain Robinson and his wife Sarah, but uh, it's conveniently been converted into a uh, museum gift shop. Stock it as, as well as we can with uh, memorabilia connected with this lighthouse and uh, cards and postcards and such. Um, all kinds of different items that uh, one can purchase as a memento for their uh, trip to our glorious lighthouse here, our wonderful Sentinel. And uh, standardly you're greeted uh, with a warm welcome and uh, given a brochure which uh, tells our history and then it kind of flows where it, uh, it goes into the front museum room with the uh, the collection of photographs of our light keepers and then you're on your way into the tower and the various levels which we just covered so uh, we hope that uh, you come visit us uh, we are open from May through the end of October and um, so there's never two days alike at the that top of that tower there's uh, Lake Michigan is ever changing and uh, lots of different shades of blue and lots of different activities out here and of course we have the beach out in front and a lovely uh, walk along the pier and a nice park where if you want to pack a picnic lunch you, you can eat out here on the ground so lots to do in this area and uh, we hope that you stop by and see our lighthouse.